Well, here's the thing. One of the uh, the most ridiculous tasks that I was ever given at Sub City was so after we did the I just started and after we did that the kind of changeover at the West End Festival the next meeting I was given the task of writing the about section on the website and I don't think I ever we ended up getting something down and I was finding it so difficult and everybody was raging at me like oh, this girl's shite like she can't but what I was trying to do was represent a station with what like 120 contributors but that most of them I hadn't even heard of shows and it was just so hard to get to what what it actually was and at the time I, I wouldn't have known the term free on radio. Because I didn't like student radio and that's the kind of thing you would you would slag people you slag people's shows into like a pure student radio show on Sub City, which was I think a lot of people still saw it as a student radio station, even though it, when you get to know more about it, it, it does feel like it's a lot more than that. So the whole idea of doing a you know student radio station, you know, we in those first sort of formative meetings that we had was kind of going, you know, we we didn't have any sort of great master plan or kind of like you know these are the ten commandments of what sub city radio should be like. But um, you know the important things were we don't have a playlist. Playlist is evil. Playlist is what the other radio stations do. Um, looking back on that now whether that's a good idea or not. It's probably my 20 years of commercial radio <laughs> and consulting and all that kind of stuff. You know, it, I think if you said to anybody, you know, we don't have a playlist, most people back then would have gone, what's a playlist? Um, but the name, you know, we wanted to kind of have something that was sort of a bit cool and underground, underground yeah. obviously. Yeah, when I, came, when I first turned up, it was like, no playlist, all my choice was the tagline, which, which we scrapped. <laughs> but the no playlist thing was like the thing, it was like, okay, we don't tell our shows what to play, our shows decide what to play themselves. And that doesn't sound that re revolutionary right now, but when you think about Radio 1 and how Radio 1 works and Clyde 1 and how every other station at the time that was on air worked, mm -hmm. when you get a station popping up for a month that's not doing that, well, it's a revolution, you know? doing a kids show um, and uh, it was sort of like encouraging you know like young kids to get on radio blah blah blah, blah. so and then my first mix in here I was like standing on top of a flight case <laughs> so, you know, was, I think it was like it was a Vestax at that time there was a no, sort of a silver can, uh, there was, there's been some horrible horrible mixes in here when you were like doing that on the kids show, was it like hip hop? What were you like? How did you start listening? Yeah, to it was, uh, it was, it was hip hop stuff, but it was like, um, you know, obviously it had to be heavily censored because the show was like one p.m. on a Saturday afternoon or something like that. Like, the guys that used to come in after us to do the show would be um, sometimes it would be like the freak maneuvers who were like the hip hop guys who I really looked up to at the time. And then sometimes it would be like Mungo's Hi-Fi. I sort of finally plucked up the courage to ask if I could maybe come in on the Freak Maneuvers show. Um, I don't think I, I think I maybe did like, I did like a little 15 minute set or something and like one time and uh, sort of remained friends with them and kind of went from there basically. You know, you had to like, everybody had to know, like there was little, little markers on it or little bits of, sticky notes on each channel like this channel's fucked so like watch out when you do this because you need to push it in this particular little direction otherwise it's not going to come on properly. You can, yeah you, you can had really, to fade like, really quick. Yeah, it was like <laughs> back then it was just about how do we get some some audio coming out of a speaker through a transmitter it doesn't matter what sound that is. This headphone thing doesn't work or um, you know this needs replaced and such and such and there's just like ashtrays everywhere and you know empty beer bottles, just the whole place was just kind of... But, so it's definitely, it's definitely tightened up a lot since that, you know what I mean? It's but. cleaned up. <laughs> <laughs> so my dad's been doing a show in Subside for years. Your dad did it first? Yeah. He, dad's he, been doing it for years, man. 
when we spoke to him, he told us you did it first. Then he emailed me to tell me that we had to cut that bit out because he thinks you did it first. I brought them in, and probably to my ways to say I don't regret it, but I brought them in. There are photographs of Sean, the first time Sean was in the studio. I was there for years, like way too long. Um, so he came out at the age of 16, 17, something like that, and to help me out because I, I wanted to. Uh, sit at the uh, the desk we were scrapped and he could queue up and, and play and stuff, you know. They had a show called Dad Rock that I remember that was like, kind of funny, it was just kind of like playing like 60s psychedelic garage rock, like stuff that'd be on like Nuggets compilations or whatever, you know. And um, he was kind of interspersing it with like, you kind of collect they used to collect, they used to swap tapes with guys in America, they would record the radio, just random channels, and send him over like a pack of tapes. He would do the same, he would record like UK radio and Scottish radio for them. So he would just be like recording Clyde One and then like Radio Scotland and then whatever, you know, and send the tapes over. So we would be on like holiday and stuff and that all, would, all we would listen to were these like American radio stations. This was the time when like OJ Simpson with trials on and all that. So he used to chop like, weird skits and eye dents and stuff out of those stations and then play them on his show and stuff like that. But I remember being in the studio, like, queuing up records for him and kind of helping out with that stuff. Did you ever listen to his early radio efforts? Uh, the show he did with Ross Burchard? I, I occasionally tuned in a, um, a, oh, what was it? It was, it was Solar a Sunday Island. night one, it was Solar Island, but uh, I, I occasionally tuned in. Was it Zoo Radio? Some, <laughs> there, was, there was Zoo Radio. I much prefer the G20 squad, you know. <laughs> <laughs> what about, uh, did you ever hear the Cloudo and Gobo show? Uh, no, no. Really. That was his happy hardcore one? Oh, right, right. That's probably why I didn't hear it. Yeah, that's, that's all. It's, do you remember showing mine a lot of happy hardcore? Oh, I still do. I <laughs> still sit in his room. But I was also like, when I was a wee guy, obsessed to listening to these like pirate radio stations. Used to get like Pulse FM and all this stuff, and all it was was rapid hardcore on like the sketchiest FM signal. Phone ins, like people would phone in for shout outs and phone in for bam ups and all that. Phone in to fight with rival gangs and they'd be phone in doing prankies and stuff. And I was like, this is brilliant. This is great radio. And I was like, I kind of want to do it as well. At the at unit at the time, there was quite a quite a kind of snobbish element to a lot of the stuff that folk would. Folk would be kind of slagging off the bams quite a lot, and like I don't know, it just seemed it just seemed a bit weird. So I I, I I kind of did this radio show where we played happy hardcore and mixed it tight and rapid and really good. But we also did prank phone calls, and most of the prank phone calls we did were to the students and lecturers and stuff from like that. The notice board. Yeah, we, we got all the numbers from the notice board. Room to let books for sale, whatever it would, whatever it would be. And we just phoned them up. And the thing is, when we first started doing it, we were just phoning them from the studio phone. And you couldn't block a number on it, so we were just like blazing, just phoning them up on speakerphone like that, and just doing really crap prank calls, you know. Like a lot, of, sometimes if you take a good one, like you get one per episode that kind of be funny and not too offensive, or whatever, you know. But hello, is that is that is that Jennifer? Yeah. How you doing? It's Gobo. I saw your advertisement on Gumtree. Oh yeah, yeah. Hi. It says I have to call you Jennifer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. Yeah. How you doing there? How you doing, Jennifer? <laughs> not bad. Not bad. Are uh, you you uh you stay in where is it Govan Hill? Yeah, I stay in Govan Hill, yeah. Uh tell us about Where did, what? what was that hen? Sorry? Look, tell tell us a bit about your, your flat, your your place of residence. It's um well it's just like a kind of two room and kitchen um flat. It's in Calder Street, I don't know, do you know Govan Hill at all? Well what the, the young team I fight with fight with him. So I was thinking about no, I mean using your place as a scout tower. <laughs> oh yeah. Nah, let's forget it, eh? Uh, oh well, then we'll, we'll not get we'll not get a scout tower to check out with uh, the Govan Hill young team up then. We played characters for sure. You know, we played kind of almost like played the character of the Bam. I was too afraid to be at school or something. You know, you know what I mean? But yeah, one of the guys from Swallow did at least a did a study, and I think it was for his thesis, but I'm not sure. But it was like. Uh, like an anthropological study where he, he, he watched people in the booth for like a week and that was the thing he noticed that people had this 
everybody almost had a persona of some kind. But most people that got super, most people just like it was like a slight nudge of themselves. But some people just took the opportunity to be wherever they wanted to be. And I was I was always a big. I was a, there was an argument for years about getting a webcam in the studio, and I was always like a pure anti-webcam guy. There's webcam footage of you playing bass guitar in the studio. <laughs> well, that's probably a, a, a prime example of why webcam footage is a bad idea. There's also some, there's also some really good stuff of you and your dad in the studio together, which is really sweet. Yeah. It's really, really cute. <laughs> My webcam was terrible. It was like really yellow all the time. Yeah, it it only took like a picture once every five minutes or something. You had to like, people would like pose for it coming around, like they'd be like, oh, it's about to take the picture. Um, but yeah, it just it, for me, it just ruined the magic, you know? Like, if I want to pretend I'm a submarine, then I should be able to be in a submarine that's radio, that's it, fine. Bands played upstairs with John Matt, going back to all the kind of famous sessions, like, Franz Ferdinand and the Eagles and stuff like that, you know. Franz Ferdinand was at Sleedy's. Was at Sleedy's. Was recording, recording. Recording. Yeah, yeah. Well, other ones were yeah, upstairs. Yeah, yeah. Um, so that was kind of the usual format. They played upstairs and they'd come down and have a chat. Um, kind of classic. Kind of run a big cable. I remember doing that. I guess it's the live lounge format or whatever, you know. But they're not doing awful covers of pop songs. Um, and then we moved into that space. Which was previously a bookshop. Previously a bookshop. Tear the night, it's just empty space. And then they move in all this super old school gym equipment, sitting right in the middle. Like the main space in the building became this weird sort of kind of back alley gym where guys in um, like crow onesies were just like, rowing and working out. And the place stank, man. Again, part of that kind of frugal subsidy atmosphere of seeing a potential to do something and do it quite cheap and do it kind of, oh man, we really make the most of that, that nothing, that just black hole in the middle of campus, we could really do something like that. But instead, it was that, that kind of didn't make any sense to us. It was, do you want to say, do you want to introduce this, but like we did a session. What do you mean? It's be like, we did a session with Andrew Jackson D-Head and KP Gooley. So, so, so Andrew Jackson G-Head, um, who, I guess, they probably got quite a lot of traction in the UK now, I think the last time they played, they probably played a relatively big room compared to what they had been playing the, couple, the previous couple of times. So they were playing um, with a guy called Kepi Gooley, who was in a band called The Gooleys, who were a pop punk band. And I'd been in touch with them beforehand, and I think we'd kind of been okay to go to do the session, but then Radio Silence hadn't heard anything. I did a bit of the set off and I left them and went to the show, and then just went up to one of the guys in the band and kind of said, all right, I've kind of been emailing you a couple weeks ago, he's still, he's still into doing that. Totally forgotten about it. He's on tour, you know, you forget, you know, when you're trying to organise something, this guy is not replying to your email within 10 minutes because you're really psyched about interviewing them or whatever. And you realise they're living out of a van and they've got one change of clothes. So we end up driving and we go across that bridge that's by where the quota used to be and everything. That one of the lanes is only public transport and we bail across that and instantly get pulled over by the police. It's like, oh man, we are just, we're going to get lifted and we're not going to get to do a session. They let us away with it because what they pull us over and they figure out like, these guys team and they just realise we're not we're just clueless, absolute idiots. <laughs> when they pull up, they're pulling into the main building of the university and it's this weird. I guess they don't know it's Neo Gothic, it could be five hundred years old then, but they don't know it's hundred fifty. But uh, so they're seeing this big castle. It's kinda of middle of darkness, so we're letting them in this back door. And it's a bit weird, you know, then you go into this abandoned space and their eyes light up and I think it was just so much better than what they were expecting, so much cooler maybe they were expecting a room like this or something, you know? Strip lights and all. Play it's really great set, really sweet. Um, the recording's kind of, I mean, it's, it is what it is. It's in that room and it's all live. And there's a bit where I think it's, I think it's Neil Young cover they're doing "Looking for a Love," which is which is one of my favorite Neil Young songs. It's on Zuma, which is an incredible album. Like really, like that album is hit after hit. You know, it's kind of. I think "On the Beach" made my favorite Neil Young album, but Zuma's really great. It's crazy horse in it, you know. I think it was a bit and I think it's looking for a love where Kepi, or maybe they're doing both verses each, Sean and Kepi are both singing both verses, but there's a bit where one of them just steps too far away from the microphone. So you kind of out for that whole verse, but it kind of gives it this whole accidental call and response, you know, and it kind of like the recording is full of stuff like that, you know, like little, little mistakes in the sound of that room and everything.
were sitting up in the office and they were kind of again just catching up with their emails for the first time in four days and I was playing them stuff you know like all oh, these guys from the studios right now fading it up like, oh that's cool and like, oh, this guy was on two days ago that's quite a good show and kind of and I think they were into it you know um, and then yeah they went on their way they crashed that night went on their way the way that's edited like really excited me I was super into this like like in between songs not being like like hey you're listening to yeah, this yeah, yeah. just like in between like, the show is just that yeah, yeah, yeah. Just, like in between songs you hear them like putting down like having a drink and stuff and there's kind, of, kind of more there's bits of that that aren't in there because it was just too much but it was this kind of expansive just that like, everyone's hanging out in that room yeah, yeah just bits that I cut out are probably you know people squelching across the broken floor and knocking stuff over because it's like, place was a wreck you know yeah we did Scroobius Pep after that which is a favourite to the KMU um, I think he was playing there for some was it like yeah, was it an NME thing was going on or something maybe I remember it was, it was, like, it was associated with similar event and we were yeah. doing a session for it and we didn't know why and no one really yeah. wanted no one wanted the content like, he seemed like a nice guy I'm trying to think of so you didn't you weren't really that involved in radio then <laughs> came to uni and was like, oh, there's going to be mad parties. And there wasn't any mad parties. So I was like, all right, well, let's, let's just them. throw them. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I went into Holes for the second time, like already having had my ideal of like, this is what Holes is like. Like you go and it's like red cups and like topless girls doing like guzzling beer whilst like the best tunes are playing. Like people are having a super good time. Like all this shit that just like the fucking narrative of like what an actual party uh, is portrayed as and what student life is like and having had that smashed like or at least smashed in Aberdeen being like dude <laughs> <laughs> can I sweat? yeah of course <laughs> do as you please <laughs> <laughs> everyone's like alright cool American Pie like yeah let's do this and you walk into a sequence of rooms that are just like kitchens fully illuminated like just somebody else's flat and you go in there like party 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 like I pre-drank to turn up to this turn up and it's just like 15 people standing really awkwardly with some shite tunes playing out of an iPhone in the corner being like, oh, right, cool, can we make this fantasy a reality? We've got no idea what we're trying to. Oh, look, two people have got smashed and now sleeping together. And everyone else is just kind of awkward and being like, right, sweet. So I turned up here and met Matthew, who already had like a few years of experience doing this stuff um, and just having the enthusiasm of wanting to do it. Like, so the entire... Uh, you know, building like uh, whatever little vibe we wanted to create like it had to be exciting what make like compact units of parties in which everyone who goes to the party you just smash the party so good that everyone's then talking about it and has stories from it um, was looks doing I think it was an English lit, lit course I think it was that. Is that right? I think so, yeah, <laughs> I yeah. I told you already. In every party, we just picked a different theme and then picked everything about the party, like the venue, the promotion, everything to match whatever that theme was that we wanted to do. So we did a party called the Dark Party. It was in the Light Club. Um, Sorry. It's Dark Party Light Club. Sorry, it's a good, solid, solid concept. It was really good, though. Really, 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 really good. It was just lit by candles and strobes and then... <laughs> There was one projector that was just projecting videos and Chris Casey and the other guy and I sat up the night before like making visuals and all we found was just like videos of chicken factories where they're like dismembering bodies and that. It's finished set up and I was like, it's it's great, it's great, it's like nine out of ten, but there's something we're lacking. I was like, smell, we're missing smell. And it was like a late November party, so I kind of wanted something kind of like Christmassy. So I went out to George Square and got some like pine tree needles and then like rubbed them on the walls. <laughs> to try and make it smell Christmassy yeah, and nice. Natural. Did that work? Yeah, I think so. People, I, people, was, when people talk about that party, they always say, I mean, couldn't see very much, it was pretty dark, but damn. Have you got any like particular events you'd want to talk about? Um, well, Dimension B. Everyone at the time, the, the chat was always about a base space, and um, 
his, his face did look as if it had been, as if it was kind of melted off. We ended up talking about the, this stupid joke about there was that much face that had <laughs> ripped the fabric of reality, and that was where I mentioned he came from. That party was mad. There was like the prep for it was like the comic, which, which didn't get printed. <laughs> Because you see all these like really grand plans of such enthusiasm. So there was a comic which was meant to be eight issues or six issues or something at first, because the entire party had gone from the year where we've created these kind of themed parties with some kind of narrative behind them that have been a success to like, all right, we're going to turn that into like even a hyper level. We ended up doing a comic, which is a terrible <laughs> idea because everyone's at uni and it took up far too much time, but it was pretty fun to do. It came out, what was it, a day? before the actual party, which was originally meant to be six parts, distributed in paper format, different places in the run-up to the party to build hype. And it was all about Gavin Reynolds. <laughs> Gavin Reynolds was the subject matter in all this. <laughs> it was all about IT manager Gavin Reynolds. <laughs> <laughs> and occupied them for the best part of a month and a half, coming up with this storyline, drawing all these characters, making this mad comic about how Gavin, as the system administrator of reality, had created an alternate dimension B and dimension A was going to be deleted and everyone was going to get shipped through to it. And... And there was the portal and there was the twins. Oh, God, I forgot about all this shit. Fucking hell. Yeah, fuck. That was Matthew Craig in a lab coat, like, standing outside the art school with a fucking shipping container with the doors that closed either end. Fraser Graham had made an uh, audio sample that was like an airlock and then it was the time tr like the dimension transportation like sound whilst a little smoke machine went Shh. for every like three or four people who came into the school of art like had to have that experience and then went up the ramp into the art school where there were posters everywhere the idea was they were all just like completely homemade missing posters with raj word art and like crazy fonts and like just mm, the mess that you see when you see like lost cat or like lost dog posters or like any kind of homemade promotional like propaganda. We built this 12 foot steel rigging thing which was ridiculous and then we projected onto it and me and Sean stayed up for three days straight making content for it. That definitely was a highlight and it's the only Halloween year where I've not actually made a costume because I've just been making stuff for Sub City. Totally. But it was ridiculously fun. Yeah, and that was for Dimension B. Oh, sorry. Sorry. Cheers. Cheers. I've got a you in a minute, alright? So that was overproduced, um, but wonderful at the same time. What I enjoyed uh, in Glasgow and doing the parties was like nothing to do with the logistics of like, all right, cool, this is the scene we're in, and like, this is the kind of music we're gonna play, and just like that DJ world tour kind of mentality, which is like so good and. It's so amazing that so many people got up and into that, but I was just this, like, different kind of... I just wanted to make, like, really good parties. I didn't... Like, the impetus for them wasn't music-driven. It was just giving everybody a really good time that would then produce loads of stories for them. Uh, I think a lot of people remember that as, like, a big standout event, and it makes a lot of the work that we put in worth it, so that was pretty good. Hello. Uh, Mm. All right. uh, it should be under the DJ riser, like in the cupboard. Cool. <laughs> Never left the clock, huh? Action Sorry? Shot. Action shot. <laughs> <laughs> what other shows were you involved in over the years? Party Party, which was later rebranded re and relaunched as Disco Disco. Uh, why was that? Um, a an occasion where Dish, I can't remember what he'd done at Subsidy Press or music team. Uh, Dish had been through Duty Free, he got us a lovely big bottle of tequila. We had a, a shot, I think every time we played a record, had a link or you know anything that we could have an excuse to have a shot of uh, tequila. Encouraged people at home who were listening to drink along. This was somehow picked up by a BBC reporter who was doing a show for uh, what's his name? Fred McCauley's Breakfast Show. Uh, he was doing the news on that, ran with it, gave it the headline online. DJs taking off air over drink scandal or words to those effect. You can imagine people thought it was Chris Evans or somebody and it just popped all the way up through the, the most read on the BBC News that day. The manager, Yannick, panicked a bit. And the Yannick panicked? Yannick panicked, I 
No, controversies. Oh, no, don't want to talk about that. I had to spend the whole day with two phones to my ear. And by the evening, there was some guy trying to come up from ITV News to film me about it. And I was like, I'm not going into the office to get filmed by some <laughs> idiot about some stupid thing that's happened, you know? And it's just, yeah. Well, <laughs> Hit out some partner about us behaving to Ofcom rules. I realised how the news worked that day because everybody then copied that article, changed bits of it, and it slowly evolved into something that it wasn't originally. None of those people had listened to the original recording because we took it down immediately. You should really just have said it's on the internet, so <laughs> jog on. No rules, mate. <laughs>have a word with us and stop us doing it kind of thing. So the very first episode, I think we pretended that a guy had burst out of the studio and attacked me, pushed me around, and the last 10 minutes of the show is me on the ground screaming and Kyle's trying to get him off me and stuff. So I'm just walked in. Hey. I thought it was pretty obvious it was a joke because I'm an idiot. And uh, I remember Luke coming up to me and being like, hey man, what happened? And I was just bursting laughing. Like some janitor had asked him about it, he'd heard about it as well. And I was like, no, no, no one broke in. Like it was just, we're just being idiots. That was our first episode. And then every episode from then on in, we continually tried to like lose more listeners if we had any. We continually just tried to uh, be worse and worse until we made sure that no one else was listening. Okay, you, you need to stop. Yeah, right. I'm not even going to get into this, but listen, basically, you, you've ignored absolutely everything that was said in the training. Uh, I mean, every week I've heard you um, you apologise for things on air that happen. Um, you talk over each other. You, you talk in the background constantly off, off the microphone. I mean, you, 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 you have guests in all the time. Yeah, y y I mean, I've had a number of complaints from guests on the show who say that they've been treated unfairly or, you know, they've been cut off halfway through an interview or... It can be quite hard to... Sorry, I'm cutting you off. It's no, quite listen, hard just to... Let me I took some time off from Pry to end up doing Hong Kong Songs full-time. So we did a couple of live shows, which was pretty much the same thing as the, sh as the show itself. Kyle made his own music. We would sing very badly and we would rap. It's fucking terrible, doesn't it? And, uh, no, the, rapping, the singing was bad, but the rapping was excellent. The rapping was pretty good. Um, the lyrics were good. Uh, our flow was tight. Oh, what? The beats were tight. The beats were tight. Well, I think that's the only thing that was good. Kyle's music was really good, and then uh, my involvement just really brought it down a couple of pegs. But he needed you for protection. Or... Yeah, well, I think that's what kept it going. Because I think without me, they'd have just said, oh, "Stop doing this." But because I was there, I was just weird kind of bodyguard authority figure. That, and I think everyone kind of naturally looks up to me anyway. Um, and I would just give tips and like, you know, stance and positioning and stuff like that for doing radio shows which I've seen other presenters do, and they would just crouch over the, the decks and get a sore neck and a sore back. So you guys are going to be... It's, it's, it's totally stupid. You'd be standing back with this and create some distance. I think that's what Hong Kong Sunks was all about, creating distance. People thought that you really had to be a DJ and that was a, there was an expectation of what a DJ was. Uh, and I think that that's, that's far less now, that people can be much more open and experimental to thinking about what they do with records. You know, you can you can interact with music and you can create sound pieces and curate a show which isn't necessarily about that. Before when we did the RPZ show, the RPZ show was it was an adjunct of the club night, so it was just what we played at the really at the beginning of the night when people weren't really dancing, and that's sort of what we wanted the show to be a little bit more about. And then we do shows where it would just be like a dance set, and you would just play what you played in the club. Having finished that, and actually not doing so much club DJing. The kind of music that I want to play is com it has completely changed. And so I've been doing shows which are, uh, I've been trying to base everything around one idea. Hey, what's your show called? So, you so my, sh my show is called Music Please. And the, the idea of me changing it to that was that I, I wanted it to be really open.
so that it could be, it'd be any kind of music. I, I just wanted to be like, I'm going to try and be as open to music as I can and do different things with it. And that's what le led me to including a lot of dialogue and using bits of found radio and found TV shows so that you could actually create something which is, which is quite curated and kind of can follow through like one complete topic. This is a Music Police show. My name is Hush. It's a Monday, the 1st of December. It's World AIDS Day and my show today is dedicated to the remembrance of everyone who has been lost. I'll be playing some artists today whom I really respect who are no longer with us. And I also dedicate the show to the people who not only survive but live and thrive with AIDS across the world and to the fight that continues to find a cure. There's a great deal of historical documentation in the show today. Old newsreels and documentaries to remind people what exactly has been achieved in the battle for AIDS by the people who suffered from it and also what's been lost. World AIDS Day. More and more I see now that people are thinking about their radio show as a, as a space where they can do something creative and they can, they can play around with conceptual ideas of what music or sound can be. I've yeah. been thinking about it and I kind of dug out like loads of stuff like from when I first started and like flyers and things like that and it has really changed a lot and especially once it kind of moved more over to the listen again focus. It's, yeah, it's all it's technology that's driven the changes yeah. though and that's everything, that's not just sub city. Um, it's just progressed with the rest of the world. It's maybe something that I've got a little better at myself and stuff that I'm doing now is realising that you can walk into a situation and just change it and fuck it up and make it better or make it worse but make it different and see what happens so that when I moved then I could kind of have a fresh start with all of my experience from Sub City and just like start DJing at parties and uh, doing, presenting the radio and fine and saying my name on air and being, yeah, so it's, yeah, that's, I think I've definitely got Sub City to thank for all of that. Did you uh, know it was going to be so full of dweebs and if so would you still have got involved? That's why I got involved, because as soon as I realised that everyone was a nerd, like a nerd for, like, oh, let's go put in this party, and like, not only let's put in this party, let's put on this party, we build this thing, yeah, that'd be a really good idea, and then you're like, oh, that's a cool idea. Have we get money to do that? Yeah, we do. Awesome, do you all want to do that? Yep. And it was, it's nice, it was like a weird communist thing where you sit around thinking of a fun idea, and you're like, oh, we could probably just do that. You want to do that? All right, that's weird. Like, oh, that's a, that's a cool thing to do, let's do it. And it was secondary that people enjoyed it. It was just like, oh, that'd be a fun thing to do. Totally. Did you uh, just invoke communism in that statement? Uh... In terms of like, what people should just do whatever they want to do there, really. I mean, that's, I just, that's what it's there for, really. It's there for you to turn into whatever you want to achieve. I think it's funny when you're saying with this sort of nerds thing there, I always thought Sub City was this, just this kind of like, home for kind of musical misfits, you know, like kind of odd people that like didn't really fit into like, oh, I can't go and play this music at a club somewhere or I can't hear this on the radio, so I'm going to go and play it myself somewhere. And you meet all these bizarre people through it. That was one of the best things about it for me, you know. Get people who are passionate about the music that they're putting out and get them to come on and just play it. Totally. And people will want to listen to it. I think this is definitely a, like, a cathartic experience. Uh, I'm one of them things that I feel that they didn't know. It's therapy. It'll be therapy for everybody. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, to be honest, that's probably the long overdue. It's a bit of therapy for them that's probably broken like a lot of people. I'm still, I'm still suffering from it. It's also the thing that's influenced me most in terms of what I'm doing now. Get that on. Say that again. <laughs> <laughs> um, if you're someone that's trying to run away from something, and you're feeling very like dark inside and you, all your feelings are pushed right down. And that's perfect. Running away from life, running away from, from all my problems and just, uh, yeah, I'll sleep on this couch and we'll, yeah, let's make a comic. That's a good idea. Let's make a map of Glasgow. Yeah, that's a great idea. Let's definitely do that. You can ignore your real life, ignore all the problems, the bills that come in, just pretend they don't exist and just lie in that couch and sub say and get very involved in it and become very focused on it because you're running away from so much other stuff that you might as well just focus on this thing because then you can just pretend that doesn't exist. And uh, it's pretty good for a while until it all catches up. Mm. Pretty sure it's upsetting me. My girlfriend break up with me. I get kicked out of uni. It was brilliant. It was really great fun. It was really good. Cool. <laughs>